Okay, that should be working great. Um, <laughs> so we'll start again. So um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, I think um, we're delighted today to have Ben Marsden presenting to us. And um, I think Ben needs very little introduction for most of you. He's the Centre for um, History and Philosophy of Science, Technology and Medicine here at the University of Aberdeen's director and the brains behind this seminar series, basically. Um, in terms of research, Ben is producing a major biography of McCorn Rankin and his paper today is linked with that. Um, so without further ado, Ben's paper is called Rethinking Perpetual Motion in the Age of Energy, WJM Rankin, Henry Dirks and Engineering Science. So I'll pass over to you, Ben. OK, thanks very much. I'll just bring my PowerPoint up. <clears throat> OK, is that shared? Yep. Yes, yes, it is. OK, so here we go. Rethinking perpetual motion in the age of energy. W. Jim Rankin, who not that many people have heard of. Henry Dirks, who also not that many people have heard of. And engineering science. Uh, just to say first, thanks to Ellen for organising this and inviting, allowing me to invite myself um, to the seminar series, which she's essentially running. Also, Frank James um, organised a meeting at the Royal Institution, actually pretty much this time last year, where I gave a similar paper. So thanks to Frank and also Judith Field for asking me. Um, there's a question here, which is a kind of footnote to a footnote type question. Why did this person, W. J. M. Rankin, energy physicist and engineering educator, support Henry Dirks, an advocate of perpetual motion. So when I discovered this, I thought this is rather odd. Someone who is very much um, an enthusiast for scientific education, energy physics, etc., cetera, um, has a thing for perpetual motion machines. Why is that? So the paper really is an attempt to explain how that makes sense. And what I'll do is I'll talk through various contexts, energy physics, perplexing perpetual motion machines or machines that were considered potentially perpetual motion machines, but on reflection turned out not to be, but had a kind of liminal status. Um, I'll say a little bit about some of the discourses of perpetual motion, um, how engineers were kind of dealing with this, both scientific engineers and those who had yet to kind of get science um, in the 1850s and 1860s. And then Dirk arrives, Dirks arrives in 1861 as the author of a kind of salutary history of perpetual motion, um, a kind of anti-Smilesian venture, if you like. Um, I will then um, make a few wry comments about the scientific status of Dirks as perpetual motions historian. So, um, as many of you know, um, one of the main people who's written about the science of energy in historical terms is Crosby Smith. He's shown over there, sadly not with us today, at least I don't think he is. Um, so if you think um, in terms of context of energy physics, between about 1850 and 1860, there's a kind of transition from um, people, including Rankin, Thompson, Rudolf Clausius, expressing a theory of the mechanical action of heat, which under Thompson's terms becomes a dynamical theory of the action of heat, um, which is good at providing a theory of what are known as thermodynamic engines, and this then in the mid 1850s and onwards becomes what we would call thermodynamics or what Crosby Smith would call the science of energy and much of that is happening between about 1850 and the 1860s. Um, some of the key individuals involved with this are people like James Prescott Jewell who in a famous paddle wheel experiment attempted to show the equivalence of heat and mechanical work so doing mechanical work gives you heat uh, and there's a factor which explains how much heat you'll get. Um, Joule, like many of his contemporaries in the science of energy, believes that energy might be transformed. Uh, in that sense, it's neither created nor lost. And by about 1853, people start talking about a law of conservation of energy. In fact, Rankin states that in 1853, but at that time claims that it's well known the law of conservation of energy, which becomes the first law of thermodynamics, so-called. Um, you then have individuals like Rankin, Thompson and Rudolf Clausius, who obsess about the theoretical maximum efficiency or economy of heat engines. 
thinking that stored energy or stores of energy can be transformed into useful work, but some of that energy is lost essentially as low grade heat. And that complex of ideas in various forms uh, makes up a second law of thermodynamics. So um, Rankin, at least in my heart, um, is kind of <laughs> central to this uh, program um, in attempting both to establish the new thermodynamics from the mid 1850s onwards, but also trying to disseminate the ideas of energy science through a program of uh, pedagogy, um, essentially um, trying to make engineers uh, scientific in ways which he um, expresses at great length in a series of monographs published from the late 1850s uh, onwards. So <clears throat> this is my kind of paradox, which is in January 1856, Rankin's inaugural address to student engineers at the University of Glasgow claimed rather famously that there was a harmony of theory and practice. And in that ad address, he insisted on the waste and insanity that was caused by the visionary projects of in particular perpetual motion seekers. He doesn't like perpetual motion because it drives you mad and it shows that you are mad. Just a few years later, in March 1861, Henry Dirks publishes his Perpetuum Mobile, uh, a full account of perpetual motion schemes from about 1600 through to his present day up into the 1850s. And yet on the 1st of April, I rather love that fact, 1st of April 1867, um, Henry Dirks was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, who was his sponsor, WJM Rankin. Rankin didn't sponsor anyone else, and yet he clearly had a thing for Henry Dirks. How does this make sense? The scientists of energy seem to be interested in perpetual motion. Uh, they don't ignore it or discount it. They seem to want to engage with it. So the question is how? So if you go to the early uh, 18th century, figures like Thomas Young um, had allegedly famously debunked uh, perpetual motion. And although Young would illustrate some of the proposed perpetual motion machines, so here's an example, uh, I think it's, he was speaking at the Royal Institution. He's essentially been, uh, he's been taken in the literature as having kind of debunked the possibility of perpetual motion. Um, but, you know, you should never get a good theory get in the way of um, kind of fun, uh, practical uh, proposals. And uh, despite Thomas Young's work, if you look, for example, in the Mechanics magazine in the uh, 1820s, um, you see um, very extensive discussions of uh, perpetual motion. So they're both promoters and detractors of perpetual motion machines fighting it out in a fantastically uh, ebullient way within the pages of the Me uh, Mechanics magazine. Indeed, there's even a suggestion that a history of such uh, machines would be a useful thing to have. Um, new types of machines which appear in the 1830s and 1840s, like electromagnetic machines, are um, often um, described as being um, the genesis, the, the basis of perhaps uh, inexhaustible force. So the idea that you might get a power uh, without the expenditure of fuel, um, uh, one of the forms of perpetual motion. If you scroll onwards to the 1852, and um, we look at the figure shown there, Bennett Woodcraft. Um, when Bennett Wood Woodcraft and his staff at the patent offices put together um, a subject matter index of patents of invention in 1852, there was indeed a category for perpetual motion, uh, motive power, obtaining perpetual motion and self-moving um, power. So often the patent agents um, were in a way ideally suited uh, to become historians of um, machines, both real and imaginary. Um, Woodcraft and his staff list their nine possible patents um, for perpetual motion, including interestingly one by W.F. Cook, winding up spring to produce continuous motion, probably a contribution to uh, watchmaking. Um, so anyone who knows me will know that I tend to re uh, revert to talking about air engines at any possibility. Um, here's an example of a machine that was considered to be a perpetual motion machine and yet wasn't. Um, I'm talking here about air engines, so uh, engines which used um, heated and cooled air as the basis for developing work from uh, fuel, essentially coal. So through the 1830s into the 1850s there was much enthusiasm for these particular 
uh, engines which were designed, uh, their promoters hoped to supersede the steam engine. Two particular figures, Robert Sterling had a Sterling engine, although it was developed largely by his brother, an engineer, James Sterling. John Erickson, originally in the UK and then in the States, talked uh, pr provocatively about a caloric engine, caloric being, as it were, the older form of uh, heat, um, usually taken to be the antithesis of, of modern forms of heaters motion. Um, they thought that their engines were going to supersede steam. Why? They thought they would be more economical, they would use less coal uh, to deliver a certain amount of power. And they did this by introducing into their machines a particular um, device, which Sterling or the Sterling brothers called a respirator or economizer, and which Ericsson called a regenerator, rather controversially again. So the idea was that using the respirator or the regenerator, it would be possible um, to develop power with little or no uh, loss of heat. In other words, heat might be used over and over again to develop power. And Sterling and Ericsson were both on record as having make, made statements which appeared to suggest that their machines were in fact perpetual motion machines. No problem for them, no problem for the many backers that they found, and Ericsson was very, very successful in creating backers for his um, his schemes and indeed set up a steamship or rather an airship known as the Ericsson, which was supposed to cross the Atlantic by caloric using essentially no fuel or little or no fuel. Now, um, <coughs> how did the scientists of energy react to this? So one might think that they simply decried these machines as being um, possible perpetual motion machines or that, that false claims were being made, etc, etc. It's quite interesting that if you look into the history of energy physics a little more deeply, um, most of the figures involved um, were doing two things. On the first, um, the first thing they were doing was that they were taking the practical fact of the lack of a perpetual motion machine as integral to their arguments, which is something that Carnot did in the 1820s, or in the case of William Thompson and many others, assuming the impossibility of perpetual motion, perhaps on theological grounds, um, as something which underwrote discussions that were had about the functioning of uh, machines, including the uh, Stirling air engine, in fact. So they developed their understanding of air engines and heat engines on the basis that um, perpetual motion was impossible. And yet, at the same time, claimed uh, that it might be possible to create an air engine which could indeed supersede the steam engine, in particular by working over a greater temperature difference and thus being more efficient in use of coal or fuel. So if you look at the so-called scientists of energy, to, to use Crosby Smith's terminology, William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin at Glasgow University, James Thompson, originally at Glasgow, then at Belfast, uh, ultimately an engineering professor, Lewis Gordon, a great collaborator of William Tom Thompson, but also professor of engineering in Glasgow, James Prescott Jewell, collaborator with William Thompson, to some extent with Rankin. And Rankin himself, working with James Robert Napier in the early 1850s, all of these, without exception, were enthusiasts for the air engine, and indeed many of them, Thompson, Gordon, uh, even Jewell, Rankin, attempted either to create designs for these engines or to patent them. So in Rankin's case, he painted, patented, patented such an engine. So on the left there in the slide, you can see the Napier and Rankin uh, patent air engine on the front page of the Mechanics magazine in 1853, 54. Um, on the right hand side there, you can see an image of this. Um, um, over with uh, Rankin's attempt to explain the working of the engine using his version of the new thermodynamics. Um, and actually this was a letter sent by Rankin to his friend Napier when Rankin was attempting to get Napier's backing to develop this kind of engine. So the question was in the early 1850s, um, was this air engine best uh, explained according to the new thermodynamics and was it a perpetual motion machine? There's huge discussions about this, probably um, fo fostered by um, 
certainly fostered by Ericsson, who was a massive publicist, to some extent by James Sterling, who was a little bit uh, more discreet about it all. So you had huge discussions at the Institution of Civil Engineers in 1853, tended by individuals like I.K. Brunel, many other of the elite engineers of the day, Benjamin Cheverton, from, as, as one example, who was an inventor, commentator, sculptor, asked explicitly, is this a perpetual motion machine? But meanwhile, um, the ultimate party pooper, WGM Rankin, writing at the Royal Society of London, um, developed an extensive theory of thermodynamics and an ex abstruse thermodynamical explanation of this um, regenerator, as Ericsson had called it, the, the device at the centre of the air engine, explaining um, how it worked according to the new thermodynamics and decrying and despising the fact that it had been pre presented as a perpetual motion device. And indeed, when Rankin was trying to, uh, unsuccessfully as it turned out, trying to market his own uh, air engine with Napier, he wrote in the Edinburgh New Philosophical Journal early in 1855, and I quote, some persons appear to have imagined that a theoretically perfect regenerator would prevent all expenditure of heat whatsoever, except losses by conduction and radiation. This amounted to represent, representing Stirling's air engine as a machine for creating power out of nothing, popularly called a perpetual motion. The promulgation of that erroneous theory may have led scientific and practical men to regard the real performances of this engine as delusive and may have prevented the extension of its use. So, in other words, think, saying something might be a perpetual motion machine is going to turn sensible engineers off it. Um, you might lose good ideas by not really understanding the limits and extent of perpetual motion. Now, obviously, the way of finding out about the limits and extent of perpetual motion um, is to do scientific work. Um, here's another example of Rankin speaking just a little bit later in his address to the engineers in Glasgow, having just been appoint, appointed professor. Um, he says, men too often spend their money, waste their lives, and it may be lose their reason in vain pursuits of visionary inventions, of which a moderate amount of theoretical knowledge would be sufficient to demonstrate the fallacy. The number of those unhappy persons to judge from the patent lists and from some of the mechanical journals, e.g. Mechanics Magazine, must be much greater than is generally believed. The most absurd of all their delusions, that commonly called the perpetual motion, or to speak more accurately, the inexhaustible source of power, is in various forms the subject of several patents in each year. One form of per perpetual motion of great antiquity was made the subject of two different patents in course of the year which has just elapsed. In other words, it's a live topic. If you don't want to go mad, you really need to study science, ideally with Rankin. So if you look at the time that Rankin is writing and then just immediately beyond it, it's certainly not the case that people have heeded the words of Thomas Young and others and given up on uh, perpetual motion. Contemporary discourse was, as it says there, awash with perpetual motion discourse. If you go back a few years to Helmholtz in his famous essay, Erhalt und der Kraft, where he essentially proposed something not unlike um, the first law of uh, thermodynamics, um, he had taken as a sort of tenet that it was impossible by a combination of natural bodies to derive an unlimited amount of mechanical force. And that was for him axiomatic. And on the basis of that axiom, it was possible to develop something which looked um, suspiciously, suspiciously similar uh, to the um, thermodynamics that would be uh, produced by Thompson, Rankin, Clausius, et al. in just a few years' time. Um, William Robert Glo Grove um, at the Royal Institution in January 1856 seemed to think you could get conservation of energy from a negation of perpetual motion. So he wrote a paper called Inferences from the Negation of Perpetual Motion. So if we say it's impossible, what do we get? We get energy physics. So in that sense, energy physics is for those individuals built upon uh, perpetual motion or its negation. If you look in the engineer of 1856, so this is a new journal at this time, as, as Ellen is showing in her uh, ongoing thesis, um, there's much discussion still of perpetual motion, the fin financial hopes associated with it, but also Ala Rankin, the moral loss associated with perpetual motion schemes. And it's this at this time that we're also getting a kind of first assessments, if you like, of the new dynamical theory of heat or thermodynamics, uh, discussions of Helmholtz's work, discussions of work of individuals like Charles uh, William Siemens, etc., which are not simply taking wholesale um, the new energy physics, a very 
um, cautious about it, um, but they're doing it against the context of a new kind of consideration of perpetual motion machines. If you look at Rankin's colleague, Robert Hunt, who was a patent agent and uh, gave a paper at the Institution of Engineers in Scotland uh, meeting, that institution having been set up by Rankin uh, a year or two earlier, um, Hunt spoke about the problems associated with the cheapening of the UK patent process in 1852. So the whole patent process had been revised um, with new legislation, etc., um, and made less bureaucratic in a hope, of course, of course to improve uh, um, improve the uh, the process to uh, allow for innovation to flourish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as Hunt pointed out as an expert, it had actually led to an increased number of perpetual motion schemes uh, being proposed, as many as 10 to 20 per year since 1852, only gradually reducing. So in other words, perpetual motion is all about us. We need to do something about it. We need to work out how to talk about it in a positive and constructive way. Oops, sorry, that's moving swiftly on. So if you look in the mid 1850s, then the engineers, perhaps somewhat reluctantly, are trying to get to grips with um, Rankin and others' view of scientific engineering. Um, they're hearing about the language of uh, energy physics and very slowly adopting it, certainly not in a teleological sense. Um, there are many negative responses, many alternative language schemes, many alternative sets of understanding associated with practice and tradition, as you would expect. Um, but it's around this time, coming into 1861, that we get Henry Dirks. Um, who produces this book called Perpetuum Mobile. Um, and what I want to do now is I want to say a little bit about Dirks. I want to ask questions about the authority he had to publish lots of work. So who was he really? Why should we listen? Why should his contemporaries listen? Um, and I want to ask that question again about why the scientists of energy, or at least one of the scientists of energy, should be interested in welcoming a book of this type. So here's Dirks, shown on the right hand side there, born in Liverpool, trained as a merchant, um, a great combiner of literary and, manical, uh, and mechanical pursuits. He was the honorary secretary of the Liverpool Literary and Scientific Institution, a marvellous place where you could go and play chess, um, exercise gymnastics, uh, hear lectures on phonology or poetry, and also listen to eventually Dirks' own lectures on uh, electricity. Dirks was also a big fan of the Mechanics Institute, which was set up in Liverpool um, in the late 1830s, early 1840s. He was associated with the British Association for the Advancement of Science, so liked institutions. Uh, he was an engineer, a patentee, etc. So there's various patents that he produces from the 1840s, but he was also uh, not unfamiliar with um, the, the potential uh, that new inventions would fail. So he went bankrupt, not once but twice. Uh, first in 1841, and then he came up with another invention of beer making, but that failed as well. He went bankrupt again in 1847. So he certainly knew about what happens if you come up with inventions which are not a goer. And he also knew about the uh, tarnishing of reputation associated with bankruptcy. So one could say that by the late 1840s was somewhat, um, had a slightly tarnished reputation. Um, Dirks is known for a variety of schemes, um, but probably not for these ones, patents on sewing machines, safety apparatus for boilers and stills, worts and washers in brewing and distilling, a fire escape, etc. So there's a whole list of patents. He's clearly a kind of serial inventor in that sense. But it's interesting that some of his patents were in Rankin's patch, if you like, um, heat engines, steam engine furnaces for preventing smoke, safety valves for steam engines, etc. So he knew his work as a mechanical engineer, um, etc. He even paint, patented, and this is what he's probably most famous for, um, an optical illusion shown there. I'll just say a bit more about this. So um, this was the famous uh, Pepper's Ghost illusion of 1858, displayed at the Polytechnic Institution in London. Um, actually, eventually patented. I sort of love the idea that you can patent an illusion uh, with the Professor Pepper, who was the sort of honorary director of the Poly Polytechnic Institution in London. Having patented this and got a 14-year um, protection on it, um, they even went to law 
to prosecute plagiarists and pirates who um, had uh, basically borrowed this illusion. You can see, if you like, how it works there, which is you um, a big, um, I suppose, glass screen in front of a stage, um, a, a bright light and a person dressed up as a ghost. Um, you can reflect that onto that surface and it appears that the actor is encountering uh, a ghost kind of thing. So um, that's that's what excited the, the mid-Victorians. So um, Dirtz's relationship with the mechanical is therefore pretty pretty complicated, you know, as a merchant, an inventor. He's also interested in education and mechanics. Uh, he's a writer. Um, he's obsessed with getting credit for his inventions. He wants to make a profit, um, but he's not beyond um, deception although with deception comes um, the possibility of revelation, which I think takes us back neatly to Perpetual Motion uh, Machine. So Perpetual Mobile was the book that he published in 1861. You can see it as a late response to that call in the Mechanics magazine that we needed, or well, the mechanics profession needed a history of perpetual motion. It's not an attempt to puff, puff his own schemes. I don't think he attempted any perpetual motion machines, but it is a rather canny publishing venture in what you might call, what Crosby calls the, Crosby Smith calls the epoch of adventure of energy, the epoch of energy and of scientific engineering. Um, messages win, within the book might be the following, um, to show, as it were, just how wrong perpetual motion is in all its detail with endless examples, um, to display, but at the same time debunk certain aspects of Victorian magic, showing how the trickery works or showing what where the trickery lies. Um, it's also potentially a statement to say perpetual motion is history in the sense that we will have no more of this, let us banish this from our future practice. But it's also a history, it's a kind of history. And the question is what kind of history? So you could say it's a kind of anti smiles in tale of wasted and misdirected individual effort. Instead of individuals um, working hard, seizing opportunities and um, reaping the rewards of their individual efforts. Here's an example of what goes wrong if individuals misdirect their efforts or are encouraged to um, engage in perpetual motion schemes. So within the book, he talks about different kinds of perpetual motion or self movement, atmospheric, chemical, galvanic, etc, etc. Lots of different kinds of uh, machines. He doesn't talk about the air engine, but after all, it wasn't a perpetual motion machine, as the thermodynamicists had shown in the mid 1850s. Um, it's a kind of accumulation of schemes, but also of, of, of claims by other men of science uh, that perpetual motion was a non starter, if I can put it that way. Thomas Young, William Hill in Cambridge, Robert Williams also in Cambridge, are all cited as authors. On mechanics. These are the men that were WJM Rankin's heroes as the authors of rather proper mechanical textbooks. Um, the language of energy doesn't really appear in Perpetuum Mobile, which I suppose is a bit unfortunate for my argument, but anyway, um, I suppose no one was really using the language of energy extensively in 1861. Um, energy indoctrinated students were, at least at that stage, relatively few in number, congregating largely in Glasgow. Um, until the 1870s and onwards. And by 1870, there are references in Dirks's book to the conservation of energy. And finally, in modern editions of the book, we do get the deployment of the, the language of energy um, more uh, extensively. OK, so there's just an image of the title page. Just keeping an eye on the time. And the kinds of things that he was uh, talking about. So I was quite interested in what the reviewers made of this book, and this is quite fascinating, at least from my perspective, as a historian of engineering education. Um, why do engineers need to know about perpetual motion? Well, there's lots of reasons, actually, why student engineers should want to read this book, um, not only on a Sunday, but also as part of their studies. They might have fun. It will stop them from going mad, wasting time or getting misled. So the artisan, for example, said useful information for engineers commencing their career. Uh, the Dublin builder, um, sadly no longer in existence, said rather more controversially, controversially that this was a book 
from which the reader may simultaneously derive recreation, wholesome caution against fallacies to be avoided in the pursuit of mm -mm, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, what has yet, has yet been proved to be mythical and suggestions for future development. So there's a suggestion there that some theoretical rethinking may show that some of these perpetual motion machines do actually uh, have some go to them. Um, the engineer says this is a book that will exert a wholesome influence upon persons smitten with the vague and delusive charms of perpetual motion. So probably Rankin wrote that line for them. Um, to the young mechanician, a warning beacon in this book, to the more experienced, to guard them against the charlatanry of designed and pretended adepts. In other words, you need to know about these monsters in order to stop doing it. Um, Dirks, as some of us know, and I see that Ben Russell is in the audience or has been in the audience. Uh, Dirks was a, a big enthusiast for the Marquis of Worcester. Um, and his studies of perpetual motion led him to talk about Edward Somerset, Marcus of Worcester. And indeed, Dirks produced A Life of Worcester in 1865. Worcester had been the author of the wonderfully entitled Century of Inventions. John Agar can tell, tell us about that later. Um, and one of those was his so-called wheel, which was rather vaguely described within the book, um, treasured by its inventors, but lost sadly to posterity. Um, the wheel was a perpetual motion machine and the details have been endlessly poured over and attempts have been made to reconstruct what was going on there. Um, there was also though, a water commanding engine, a prototype, a prototype steam uh, pumping engine. And I think Ben Russell has written a paper about Bennett Woodcraft raiding Worcester's tomb to find evidence of this very thing. He can tell us more about that later, perhaps, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so Dirks also wrote Worcesteriana, is that how you say that? In 1866, which was basically presenting the data which underlay the life of Worcester. So what function uh, does Worcester um, serve in all of this discourse? Because he was a perpetual motion enthusiast, <clears throat> and yet at the same time, Dirks clearly thought that he had come up with some interesting ideas in the early modern period. So he's not simply decried as a um, as a disaster in the mechanical universe, as a sort of moral reprobate. And Dirks does in a later book entitled Scientific Studies or Practical in Contrast with Chimerical Pursuits, talk about Worcester in comparison to John Dee, uh, the famous early modern alchemist and astrologer. So Dirks says, uh, the Marquis of Worcester affords an eminent example of genius of a high order, grandly and effectively directed towards the advancement of man's political and social position. So very kind of Baconian idea of Worcester there, um, quietly forgetting about the, uh, the wheel, really. His contemporary, Dr. John Dee, the astrologer, together with his friend Kelly, the alchemist, may be appropriately distinguished as representing a class of chimerically inclined and hurtful to the well-being of society. So this is Dirks very much trying to big up the idea that in talking about perpetual motion, he's doing a kind of social good by telling people not to do it. So in the last just sort of passages of this talk, I'll talk a bit about Dirks as Dirks' encounter with Rankin, such as it was. So Dirks is desperate to get status out of this. He's had this kind of rather tarnished reputation. Um, does he ever become an institution of civil engineers? That would be a good way of getting status. The answer, no, he's not welcome there. What about the Royal Society of London? He's clearly sidling up via Worcester from the 1860s. So he denotes, denotes to the Royal Society no fewer than five bound copies of six editions of Worcester's Century of Inventions. He gives them an engraving of Worcester. He even um, gives a large number of historical scientific texts from the 16th and 17th century. Um, but despite attempting no fewer than a dozen times, he fails to be elected a fellow of the Royal Society. So you see his name appearing on the list again and again and again and again, iterate 12 times, um, but they won't let him in. They don't think that the demonstration of his of mechanical absurdity constitutes an original scientific contribution. So he's, he's not welcome there. Um, and there's a parallel actually with Rankin, which is 
you know, not exact, but Rankin was let into the Royal Society, but somewhat grudgingly, um, given that he was primarily conceived by the Royal Society as an engineer and pedagogue, only really allowed to talk about engineering things. Um, the, the referees' reports on his papers tend to kind of downplay his originality in various ways and think that, you know, regard him more of a textbook writer um, than an original thinker. Anyway, um, not uh, for the faint-hearted, um, not to be put off by his failure to get into the Royal Society of London, Dirks kind of tried everywhere else. So um, he accumulated a set of society memberships uh, through the 1860s, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, to whom he donated his books, nothing else, the Royal Literary Society, which was a philanthropic group, although he managed to fall out with them in 1867, the Chemical Society, um, on the basis of what? Well, on the basis of his malt extraction invention. Remember the one that had made him bankrupt for the second time. But he did have a doctorate of letters um, at the College of Tusculum in Tennessee, perhaps not of an international reputation, although it was a real college. Um, not sure whether he actually paid for this, although who could complain? I think you could pay for doctorates of letters at the University of Aberdeen in the 17th and 18th century. Brad can maybe tell us about that. Um, he also joined the Royal Society of Arts, the Society of Engineers, the Institution of Inventors, you name it, he clearly collected institutions. What about the Royal Society of Edinburgh? Well, the Fellowship of the Royal Society of Edinburgh came on the 1st of April, 1867. I wish I was giving this on the 1st of April. Um, this, of course, was the society which had published Rankin's Thompson's work. Um, on thermodynamics from 1849. In other words, it was the the, the heart, really, of uh, the certainly the Scottish um, publications on energy physics and thermodynamics. Right. Um, so in April 1867, Dirks was virtually, as it were, welcomed by none other than the Royal Society president of that time, Sir David Brewster, well-known name uh, like Duke Dirks. He was uh, interested in optical physics, illusions. Uh, magic actually also technical journalist a big enthusiast for engineering education so brewster presumably approved of this um, application and he had been proposed for the royal society of edinburgh fellowship by our friend or my friend at least um, my sort of friend uh, mccorn rankin um, it would be lovely to have a set of letters between them but rankin never really wrote letters to anybody um, I suspect that Dirk simply courted Rankin as he courted uh, members of the other societies. Glasgow University certainly now has copies of pretty much all of Dirk's works. Um, it, I haven't been able to check under lockdown, but I think it's quite possible that those were donated by Dirk's. Um, and Rankin, you should remember, did only ever sponsor one person to Royal Society of Edinburgh Fellowship, despite having a 22 year uh, connection with the Royal Society of Edinburgh, that one person was Dirks. So I think it doesn't mean nothing um, that Rankin, either in a weak moment or in an act of inspiration, decided to sponsor and endorse uh, Dirks's connection with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, some conclusions then. Um, this is really just by way of a summary of, of what I've been saying. So. Um, we've seen that from the late 1840s, 1850s, there were uh, new reasons to rethink perpetual motion, especially with this science of energy. I've talked about the way in which um, many of the early uh, energy proponents, certainly in Scotland and uh, Britain more widely, in many respects kind of built um, their understanding of the mechanical uh, world through that sense of a negation of, of perpetual uh, motion. Um, there was a particular reason for them to be interested in perpetual motion machines because one of their prized projects, although ultimately successful, was um, the air engine, the Stirling engine in particular. And um, the problem for them was that it had been proposed as a perpetual motion machine, but in fact wasn't. And it was rather difficult for them to explain precisely why it wasn't a perpetual motion machine because the action of the regenerator or respirator uh, was was difficult to understand. Rankin tried very hard to explain it. 
Um, so by the late 18, mid to late 1850s, perpetual motion hasn't gone away. It's very much a kind of part of the discursive fabric of, of, of engineering life, if you like. Um, according to Rankin, it will send you mad. Um, but what better way to avoid madness than by knowing more about it? So the proposal, I suppose, is that Dirks comes along in a rather timely way in order to, doc to document um, perpetual motion schemes of the past, perhaps by developing a history which says, don't do this, it will send you mad, it will make you mad, um, only mad people do this, etc. Um, but uh, in a way, there's a parallel between um, actually Massen in the 17th century, um, working with Descartes, etc. in the mechanical philosophy, which is in order to understand, you know, a miracle, then you need to understand the mechanical foundations of, of the fabric of the, the, the universe, etc. Um, so a better mechanical understanding in 1850s and 1860s terms of uh, the engineering and natural universe allows you to describe and delimit, if you like, the extent of perpetual motion madness. I think that's probably what I'm getting to. So I think um, I will stop there, having gone slightly over time, and I will.